Hello, and welcome back to Gunfighter Life, the podcast where we talk about gunfighting the right way. With God at the center, with Judeo-Christian values and real-world first-hand experience. Today we're going to be taking a look at the top guns, top calibers, top pairings for World War III. Don't forget to like, subscribe, and leave a review of the podcast. If you want to check out more while you're listening, you can go to goodshepherdtraining.com. With that, I'll plug in the bio. If you want to skip it, skip around 3 minutes and 45 seconds from where it starts. First and foremost, I am a servant of God, preacher, a fisher of men. God is number one in my life and everything that I do in this podcast is no different and I don't apologize for that. A little bit about me in the background, I grew up, I guess what you would consider a heathen, didn't grow up a Christian, but I grew up in the southeastern United States, what most would consider very poor. Hunting and fishing and shooting. Joined the Marine Corps at 17. Did a couple of combat tours in Iraq. After my combat tours in Iraq, I was an urban warfare instructor for the United States Marine Corps under Mojave Viper. I also served in law enforcement for several years in LAPD. I worked patrol assignments and more specialized assignments. Where by God's grace, he got me through some nasty places in this world of war zones. And some of the nastiest streets in the country. Not because I am better. Because God chose to have mercy on me. And had a purpose for me. And I'm thankful for that. After my time in law enforcement. I was a private contractor. For federal government. For a three letter government agency. I won't specify. Doing private contracting work. I'm very much involved in guns and gunfighting. I also served in the U.S. Army both full-time and part-time National Guard. I should say my primary MOS is in both branches of the military or infantry as of one sort or another. Specialized infantry in the Marine Corps and an MOS that no longer exists. I started competition shooting even before I joined the Marine Corps at 17. I won my first gold medal even before I joined the Marine Corps at 17. I've been blessed by God with the talents he's given me to win more shooting competitions than I can remember. I've won most of my competitions and rifle and pistol, but I've also competed in archery and shotgun and even muzzleloader, uh, knife throwing, hatchet throwing. I've competed in all that. I've also been a professional big game hunter and guide. Like I said, I grew up hunting and, and fishing and shooting. I've done it to put meat on the table because I like to put food on the table with the talents God's given me. I don't apologize for that. I've done it as a professional hunter and guide. I've slain all manner of beast and guided for all manner of beast. Bear and wolf and elk and deer, mule deer, white-tailed deer. I've slain ram and fallow deer and countless animals. And I don't apologize for that either. FBI certified firearms instructor, NRA, and a bunch of other three-letter government agency certifications. Blessed be the Lord my rock who trains my hands for war and my fingers for battle. Psalm 144. I've been blessed to be the commander of a tactical team, an SRT special response team in a large metropolitan area where our primary job was to stop active shooters. But again, first and foremost, I'm a servant of God, called by God to share the good news preacher, a fisher of men. With that, we will roll into the day's topic. So, the top guns, top calibers, top picks for WW3. You heard my bio, I've been to war a few times. I should caveat this with, I'm talking about like an invasion of American soil, all out World War Three. Because if you're conscripted in the army, if you're drafted, if you're whatever, you're going to get whatever you get issued. So if there would kind of be a moot point, you'd get an M4 slash probably still Beretta 92. 
But say we got invaded here this time in this war. What would be the top picks? I did a little bit of research for this episode in that I watched Red Dawn. So pretty sure this is going to be legit. I'll also caveat this with saying that no matter what I say, a lot of you will probably disagree because you'll have your own personal favorites. And that's fine. That's very prevalent in the firearms community. I expect you to be, especially if you listen to the other episodes, a strong, dominant alpha male that thinks for yourself. So I don't expect you to agree with me on everything. You have your own picks, your own choices. That's fine. Again, I'd say that mine are based on my training and experience and real world firsthand experience. Yours may differ. And that's okay. With that being said, let us get into the guns of WW3. If Cubans start dropping out of the sky, Patrick Swayze's running around and you have to start peeing in radiators. What kind of guns are we talking? Well, for me, my number one pick, or I should say my number one pairing, would be my SCAR-17. If you don't know, that's a 308 full-size large caliber semi-automatic rifle. The SCAR-17S for me. The 308, I think, in this type of environment has a lot of advantages. Got nothing against ARs. Well, I do have a few things against ARs. They've let me down a few times in war as a private contractor, as whatever. But the SCAR-17, I think, has the edge here. If you're talking about, you know, a situation where you might be taking on anti-personnel and anti-vehicle, taking out white vehicles, taking out equipment, the 308 is better at that, I would argue, than the 223. Also, if you heard my bio, know that I'm a big hunter, and I've, I like to hunt with a 308. The 308 is a fine hunting round. And if this does happen, especially where I live on the border of a 1.8 million acre national forest, hunting is a thing for me. I, I think that's overblown. A lot of people think, you know, they're preppers and they're just going to hit the woods and hunt and scavenge and survive that way. And I think for a lot of people, especially east of the Mississippi, with the population density, that might not be viable, especially if they're not good hunters to start with. But I think if you're somewhere out west like I am with very, very low population density, I think it's a little bit more viable. I still have food stored, that being said. But that 308 SCAR-17, and I have mine, and this isn't pie in the sky. Like This is my rifle. It's one of my go-to rifles. It sits next to my desk when I'm at work. I used it in the private sector as a professional gunfighter. Mine's mounted with a Trigicon. One to four. This is not a sniper rifle, but it's a decent long range rifle. It's a good clear four power scope and I dial it down to one power for urban environments for close quarters stuff. And is it heavier than an AR? I'd say maybe. I mean, it's 7.7 .7 pounds. You can get a lot of ARs lighter than that, but a lot of ARs and M4s are heavier than that. I keep mine pretty minimal. A 1 to 4 on it, and I have a white light handy that mounts on it. And that's it. 20 round box magazines. Can I carry as much ammo? No, but I think I could carry plenty for this scenario. My go to load for that is the Federal 150 grain Power Shot, the same one I use in my hunting rifle. That'd be my number one pick, and I would pair it with a Ruger Mark IV. That's a 22 caliber handgun. You may think that's a little odd. I think it's a fine pairing because things have gone drastically wrong if I have a SCAR-17 and I've gone to my sidearm. Also, I train quite a bit with that handgun. It's super accurate. It's mounted with an optic with a backup iron sight, so if something happens to the optic, I can take it off. It is very accurate. And I do quite a bit of handgun hunting, and I have done quite a bit of handgun hunting. And I already have a rifle for big game and I think that'd be a fine pairing for smaller game, for grouse, for for dove, and for things like that. Also, I've professionally trapped. Like, I, I know how to do that. And I'm trapping. I don't want to dispatch that animal with a 308. That 22 will come in handy. <clears throat> and my particular one happens to be the Ruger Mark IV 2245 Tactical. 
It's a great gun, a little heavy. If I was building one specifically for this, I'd probably go with the 2245 light because it's obviously, as the name implies, lighter. But I'm talking about stuff that I, I have this stuff, to what I would go with. If I was, you know, going just for this scenario, I'd probably get the lighter one and pack a little bit more ammo and or probably water. But you got the 308 semi-automatic rifle for combat and the big game hunting, and you have the 22 for batching trapped animals and hunting small game. All right, with that, my next pick probably going to upset some people, but that's okay. I often say this is my go-to weapon if I could only have one gun for blank, for like, I don't know what's going to happen. And that's a 12-gauge shotgun. And for me, it's a Benelli M2. Now, why? Because even with my background, I can count the number of gunfights I've been in on both hands and have fingers left over. But I can't recall the number of times I've eaten food. And if you want a tool to put meat on the table for survival, I don't think anything is as good as a shotgun. You can make an argument for the twenty two. But I still think the shotgun's better, especially if I'm running around and I'm shooting game that's on the move or shooting game as opportunity. I can hunt anything from a morning dove to to an elk to protection against a grizzly bear to taking out an engine block. And, you know, when I was a cop, if I was doing urban stuff, even though I had an access to fully auto, you know, M4s, car 15s, or a mini 14 or sub guns. I was going in to make entry on a house. I grabbed the Remington 870 12 gauge shotgun. Why? Because it's the best tool for the job. And my goal wasn't to grab what looked best on Instagram. Instagram wasn't even a thing back then. It was to make it out of that house alive or get through the other side of that house alive. For that, the shotgun is best, in my opinion. Nothing rivals the shotgun with double up bucker, my personal favorite, number four buck. For up close, devastating power. Now, yeah, I do give up a lot in range on that. And my Benelli's have been ridiculously accurate with slugs. But I have no problem engaging, let's call them full-size targets, to 100 and 125 yards. My shotgun set up with rifle sights. I know I'm giving up some range. But if we're talking about this scenario, likely you're using guerrilla tactics. Evasion is a big thing. And again, I think eating, unless I'm being supplied with food by somebody else, in which case, you know, this may not be the best choice. If I have to put food on the table, I don't think anything rivals the flexibility of the shotgun for doing that, and it's a fine close-in weapon. You do give up a little bit of range, and you do give up capacity. So if I was pairing this one, and this is a tough pick because I love my STI 2011s. They're kind of prom queens. They require a little bit more maintenance. So I'd probably go with my Wilson Combat Beretta 92. It gives me plenty of capacity. Good backup for if the shotgun ran dry in a, in a hairy situation. But if I go through, you know, nine rounds of double up buck or slugs, <laughs> I got problems. Again, guerrilla tactics on this. But that'd probably be my pairing. It'd probably be my backup for that. And it wouldn't really be a need, need to be a hunting tool because if I have a shotgun, that's going to be better in pretty much every conceivable scenario for hunting. And again, I love handgun hunting, but I like it because it's challenging. If I'm trying to eat, I want the shotgun. And my last pick, but would still make the list, would be one of my ARs. I have two. I'm not a gun collector. I'm a gunfighter. I have an AR pistol. I have a pretty nice had it long before I ever heard the term, but what you would consider like a recce rifle. I used it doing inter interagency task forces. But either one of those are good. I'd probably pick the latter, the recce rifle setup. I've, I've had that AR for 15 years. I've used it on a lot of missions. It's a great rifle. It's one of the reasons I never got rid of it and I kept it even though there's newer, hotter things on the market. That AR of mine is ridiculously accurate. I mean phenomenally accurate. It is an Adams Arms, one of the old school Adams Arms. I believe they went away and came back, but this is a, it's a good, accurate rifle. It's a pencil barrel. It's light. It shoots fast. It shoots accurate. Got it mounted with a Leopold 1.5 to 4. 
I got it mounted with 45 degree offset iron sights for the close up stuff. Ammo is lighter so I could carry more of it. Almost useless for hunting. I mean, I have hunted with an AR. It's a great varmint round. I don't want to eat varmints. The thing about varmint rounds is they pretty much destroy most varmints. That so you get a lot of tissue damage. This might anger some people, but an AR is not a good choice, especially in 223 for hunting. Would I hunt a deer with a 223 if that's what I had and I was hungry? Yes, of course I would. But it is not a great choice. And just to be different, since I picked the Beretta 92 for my last choice, I'd pair this one with the M17 with the Trijicon RMR on it. One of the reasons I, I might do this is, if I did break my optic on my rifle, I could conceivably mount that Trijicon RMR on my rifle, and it would still be a decent optic. I like the Trijicon RMRs that are tritium fiber optic, no batteries. I don't like tr trusting my life to things with batteries. I've just learned that lesson the hard way. Same thing with the optic on my SCAR-17. It's a Trigicon tritium fiber optic. As long as radiation is a thing, that optic should work. Handgun optics are the same way, tritium fiber optic, made in America. My go-to kind of setup for this type of stuff, real world first-hand experience. I like the battle belt. It is my favorite. Obviously, I wore a Sam Brown when I was a cop, which is like the cop version of a battle belt. I wore a battle belt, say, in the private sector and as a private contractor think they are the best, the most mobile, best option for carrying your kind of gear, tactical reloads. Uh, my go-to knife would be my Topps Knives, Topps Tom Brown Tracker. I kind of thought that knife was kind of a gimmick knife, and then I got it, and actually, I really like it. I think they're very useful blade shape, very useful design. It has a saw on it. Mine's set up with a ferro rod and a couple other things on it. But that knife is great for a lot of things for... Anything from dressing out and butchering game it would be fine for to making kindling to creating a shelter. I pair it with that. And I've done a whole episode on my War Belt Battle Belt. So if you want to check that out, you can go check out another episode. But I'd go with the kit that I have and that I'm familiar with. If you're not training now and good with the stuff that you have, this would not be the time to learn it. Go with what you know. And you say, why did you not mention the AK-47? Well, because in this scenario, most likely... Assuming you survive your first gunfight, you probably get an AK-47, if that's what you want. And I like the AK. I carried one in Iraq. At certain times, I think it is a fine battle implement. Wouldn't be my first pick. I'd take the SCAR-17. You can disagree. If the war lasted that long, I'd probably be dropping the SCAR-17 after a while if I couldn't get ammo and grabbing one of those. So this is a good one to leave your comments. What would you pick? You know, Leave a review of the podcast and put in there what your picks would be. If you leave a good, respectable, respectful, I should say, review, everybody else know, you know, I can't believe you didn't say the Glock 17, I'd pick the Glock 17. Wh whatever you want to say on there, let people know, and respectfully. I will say if you like this podcast, you check out the Alpha Male podcast. We talk about how to be an alpha male the right way. If you care about the important stuff, you can check out Simple Man Sermons, the preachings of a simple man called by God to share the good news of Jesus Christ. If you want to check out more, again, goodshepherdtraining.com, goodshepherdtraining.com. If you thought this was worth a dollar, consider supporting on Patreon. These are free to listen to, but they're not free to put out. So if you want to help support the tribe, you like the kind of content, you like to listen to it, you think it's worth a dollar. Less than, you know, one round of good high-quality 308 probably nowadays. You can do that. Again, Patreon, GoodShepherdTraining.com. Go to GoodShepherdTraining.com. There's a link right on there. With that as a thanks for staying tuned till the end of the episode. The tactical tip of the day. We talked enough about guns, I think, for this. Tactical tip of the day. What one of the number one killers is that I've heard in warfare, one of the biggest causes of casualties, be dirty water and infections. Things like dysentery, natural disasters, dirty water is a lot of times an issue. Getting an infection, definitely an issue. One thing that can help with both of those, iodine. Iodine is not super expensive. You can get it in the little tablets. If you're talking about what we're talking about today, running around the mountains, fighting foreign invaders, Buy the liquid iodine and keep it in your house. It's good to purify water of not everything, but a lot of things, if you know how to use it. To what those little water purification tablets are, also make it a little bit thicker. It is used in hospitals. It's used to clean wounds and 
and things like that to fight infection. So iodine is cheap. It's readily available. It's good for dirty water. It's good for cleaning out infectious wounds or preventing infections in wounds. You can have the coolest weapons in the world, but you're not going to be too cool if you're dying from dysentery. So there you go. Get you some iodine. Which brings us to the tactical verse of the day. And you know, I can't decide between two, so you're going to get both. Deuteronomy chapter 20. When you go out to battle against your enemies and see horses and chariots and people more numerous than you, do not be afraid of them, for the Lord your God is with you, brought you out of the land of Egypt. So it shall be when you are on the verge of battle, that the priest shall approach and speak to the people, and he shall say to them, Hear, O Israel, today you are on the verge of battle with your enemies. Do not let your heart faint, do not be afraid, and do not tremble or be terrified because of them. For the Lord your God is he who goes with you to fight for you against your enemies to save you. Now how could we not think of Joshua chapter 1? No man shall be able to stand before you all the days of your life. As I was with Moses, so I will be with you. I will not leave you nor forsake you. Be strong and of good courage. For to this people you shall divide an inheritance in the land which I swore to your fathers to give them. Only be strong and very courageous, that you may observe to do according to all the law which Moses, my servant, commanded you. Do not turn from it to the right hand or to the left, that you may prosper wherever you go. This book of the law shall not depart from your mouth, but you shall meditate in it day and night, that you may observe to do according to all that is written in it. But then you will make your way prosperous, and then you will have good success. Have I not commanded you, be strong and of good courage. Do not be afraid or be dismayed. For the Lord your God is with you wherever you go. And don't forget about Exodus 15. The Lord is a man of war. With that, thanks for listening and have a blessed day.